Welcome to Inside New York's Art World. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and our guest today is Alex Katz, whose larger-than-life stylized portraits have become known to us all, most recently as the Guardians of Times Square. A warm welcome to you, Alex well, Katz. I guess it's been close to 25 years now that you have been concerned with ideas of intimate scale and classic shape. Everyone is so smooth and so clean. The sun always shines, the sea is never polluted in your works. In fact, it's often been said that your wrinkle-free subjects live in some bucolic age. How would you describe your subject matter? Um, well, I think uh, I think what's uh, I think the style tends to give you that feeling about the subject matter because if you if you look at the subject matter, you see people do have age. You know, specific you can tell what, you can tell pretty much how old a person is, and it's not all young people. It's um, the style that does give that appearance. Um, I think that that type of a style is something where it's not suitable for uh, uh, say uh, dwelling on dwelling on. Um, Uh, let's see, like dwelling on small details. It's like a big, it's a big style and it's a big line. That makes it seem a little wrinkle-free. Uh, I've always felt to, that to have a big style, you'd want to, um, do something where the style is almost a subject matter, in a sense. Well, the subjects seem so free from decay or distortion, or live in a world that is free of angst. Are you such an optimist? Well, I, 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 that's uh, something that's, uh, it's, yeah, we'll go to that. I, I guess it's hard to, um, I think everyone has natural tastes. And I know that uh, when I was a young man and, uh, I just couldn't take ex all that. I mean, there was a heavy info. If you went to a young artist studio, he had a Camus on his coffee table. And I just couldn't take it seriously. It had nothing to do well, with it. Well, that was 1954. Yeah, around there. And I was just having, I wanted to have a real good time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if there were, you know, if there were unpleasant things in life, it just like the whole idea was to minimize them. And have a nice good, have a nice time. And don't bother your friends with uh, sad stories. I mean, I guess that's sort of a, a natural, uh, what you would call a natural part of my personality or temperament. And so it seems only logical that the painting should have those qualities. I'll try to force it in the cloth. It'd be uh, I just couldn't do a good angst painting if my life depended on it. <laughs> Well, what are the crucial factors in the work? Is it light? Is it color? Is well, it scale? I think, I think uh, the light holds it together, and the scale and gesture are the, you know, like prime concerns with the work. But it's it's um, it's hard to say because when you you respond to what you think you're interested in, and people respond to what they're interested in, you respond to what they're interested in, and it's kind of uh, slightly confusing when you say, what are you doing? You know, what are you about? You know, because you're about different things. Uh, you could bring up the subject matter, and we could spend this whole, uh, you know, hour talking about subject matter, you know. The subject matter is what I started off with. Or you could talk about the style, which, you, which you're leading into with light and form, and you can spend a lot of time talking on that. It's very complicated, and I, I, I could answer questions on each part, but I don't know what, what would be the Well, why don't we start crucial. with style? 
And then we'll find out how you choose your subjects. Well, the subjects are, su are chosen for the style. And it's, uh, the basis of it is, uh, uh, it's sort of, uh, what is it? It starts with the thing of what, what, what the appearance of things are. You start with the thing of how things appear. And that, uh, seems, if you just take it on that level, the appearance of things, it seems like, oh, everyone knows what the appearance of things is. Appearance of things are. Uh, but it's not true. I think people have a very vague idea of what, how things appear to them. You know, you, you, you uh, um, the appearance of the way you perceive the outer world is conditioned by the art, and now it's conditioned by media. You know, the media is just like absolutely uh, grabbed hold of people's brains. And as, as you write the way you read, you see, you see things as you see. Now, uh, you, you say, what does some, what is the appearance of something? What does something really look like? And you start from that. You say, well, like an old master painting doesn't look like anything you see. It just looks like a dirty brown painting. You know? So then you say, well, what does anything look like? And it gets kind of a, a, a very uh, confusing thing. And when you get into aesthetics, they tell, tell you um, an apple's always an apple. And there's some constant, fa there's some co something constant about an apple and the way things look. And you, you know, if you've got any brains at all, you soon realize the apple's just moving along like everything else. And yesterday's apple isn't real today. <laughs> and you're looking at a new apple. And, and that's 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 like where the things, <coughs> the visual part of the optical thing. I'm dealing with the optical world around me, and I'm telling you. This is what it looks like. And I'm telling you, this is what a painting looks like. That's, this, that's, that's really the, uh, it's like a double assault on your sensibilities. How did you ever arrive to that monumental scale? Well, a whole bunch of reasons. It was, it was uh, uh, I wanted to make a picture that was as aggressive as a, as a Franz Klein or a Bill de Kooning. And, and when I was working with a figure on a flat background where the figure was more or less life-size, if I increased the size of the painting, the uh, figure to the perimeter would remain the same and it wouldn't really get any, uh, any real uh, muscle to it. And I felt it was kind of traditional. I wanted to move into some, I, I, you know, it's sort of the, pro the problem was to see, see, see a new world in a new way. And it all made sense to go large. There was no precedence, or not very many, on it. And it seemed like a real exciting kind of thing. It had that whole thing of logically dealing with, you know, life size. You know, well, uh, if you say, if, if you say life size, and I say, well, "What are you talking about?" Because <laughs> you know something very close to you is very large, and something very far away is very small. And if you cut out people, and their photographs look smaller than people, people in caskets never look the right size. <laughs> you know, dead people, and live people, and there are all kinds of things that you have. You have like. Uh, conventional uh, a conventional idea of what life size is and when I'm working on the scale it's working on the scale which I consider life size in other words you're supposed to scale it to your experience and that seemed like uh, kind of an interesting proposition whether whether I could do it when I went into it it was all those a jumble a whole bunch of jumbled ideas or a whole bunch of ideas that I jumbled <laughs> Well, those realistic images are obviously vehicles that you use to convey new visual information. How do you conceptualize it? What is the process? What is the significance? Well, the, the process is, is uh, the, the craft 
or the process is, is, is how do you deal with uh, and it's deal with it. and that, that's kind of simple I paint a little picture and then I paint another little picture and I might paint five or six and they, the image sort of develops and I have an idea about them sometimes I have pretty you know ideas about I want to do a group of people and other times I'm just like fooling around no. How do you control the viewer's attention when you have that scale and that number? Oh, well, through the process, because I, I have a very, I can paint very fast. And I'll paint a sketch and I'll work out the light and, and more or less the gesture. Then I'll make a cutout and I'll get the gesture of the figure a little better. Then I'll make a drawing from the cutout. By the time I get to the canvas, it's very removed. Now, I'm, I don't have anyone around. I'm just painting from all the information I made. And uh, the, uh, uh, you can't see what you're doing anyway when you're painting one of those things. All you can see is a little bit of artwork, and you're painting it, and it's focusing back 35, 40 feet. You know, and you can't get back to look at it every three strokes. <laughs> you know? Is that how you develop that technique? And I believe yeah. it was in the 60s of the cutout, freestanding metal figures. Well, the cutout was a, sort of developed in the late 50s. It was an accident, and it just looked. They, they just looked. I, I cut up a painting I couldn't make go. I took the people out of them. And the painting, there were two life-size figures in this canvas, supposedly life-size. And when I cut them out, they're about this big. <laughs> you know, and I threw away everything else but the people. It was an eight-foot canvas. I had these little bitty people hanging around. And I put them on plywood and they hung around for a while. And I realized it didn't look like painting, it didn't look like sculpture. It didn't look like a cut-out photograph either. And it, it, I didn't know what it was, but they sure were weird. And so I figured I'd try every sculptural idea I could think of that way. And I did them on plywood. And, and some of them canvas pasted the plywood. And what I did was, uh, the idea on those was that the actual energy of painting it would, would radiate past the edge and give it, uh, make it seem lifelike. Whereas a cutout photograph always collapses, you know what you're looking at. These don't. They're, they seem more lifelike than uh, cutout photos for that reason. That's how we got into it anyway. Do you limit your models to family and friends? No, acquaintances too. <laughs> <laughs> Are there Nobody. always people that you know? No, I have, I have done some commissioned portraits too. Um, do some of them. That's that's it. So, um, I, I I like trying uh, different things. You know, I, I don't think uh, you know. Uh, I don't like the idea of being you know like uh, you know uh, the king of the peaches or something. You know. Which is the king of the peaches? Well, the best guy I could paint, the, the best peach painter around. <laughs> <laughs> you know, not so good. I think someone won that prize about seventy years ago. Something like that, right? <laughs> Um, since your family and your friends and your acquaintances are often either well-known and or distinguished figures in the art world, it's been said that your paintings serve a second purpose, and that is a kind of art world social history. Do you envision that aspect of it at all? No, when I started, it was just like you're painting people around. Well, you're sort of painting the, the social world you live in today, not the social world that existed 10 years ago. That gave him kind of, uh, it was like a live subject matter. I thought it was really interesting, the people around me, rather than try to make old paintings. In the long sweep of history, do you envision them being used as a kind of secondary art historical source? Well, what well, X well, looked like at that point in time? Most of them, just nobody, when, you know, when we started. <laughs> at least when you started painting them. When we started them out, it was just like people around. And now, I guess, uh, somebody gets, I guess, it's, some of the people are well known. I guess it would be that uh, some kind of a social history. It certainly wasn't started. It was start. It was almost the opposite. It was start. It was starting out with kind of uh, what do you call uh, not fashionable, but having the qualities of fashionable. You know, it was like people around. Who knows where anyone would be in five years or three years? You know. You mentioned uh, photographs earlier, and it brings to mind, of course, one of the tools of the photorealists. And I'm thinking of the airbrush. Is that something that you ever use? No, I don't use the airbrush. I thought about it and decided not to. Yeah. 
for any particular reason? Hmm. Yeah, I don't think I can make... I, uh, I think it'd be very difficult to work an airbrush into the technique I have, uh, which is actually, it's, uh, it's fairly fluid, and it's fairly, it it's goes towards, uh, it goes towards the, the, an idea of elegance. And airbrush could go that way, but it's very difficult. Most airbrush, the uh, photo real, is, that isn't the prime thing is to make an elegant painting. It's a different, you know, it's used differently for the most part. Did you ever consider the possibility that technology might even put handmade art out of business? Well, uh, I guess, uh, well, it wouldn't for me, because I like looking at uh, handmade things. I mean, I like, you know, if I go to Europe, I like to go to museums and look at paintings. I like to look at moldings, you know? I, I really like seeing handmade, handmade things. Uh, I think, I think uh, if a person has enough uh, what do you call talent, they can make art a lot of different ways, you know. Uh, but there's, there's always, I, I've always gotten a, a real kick out of hand, handmade stuff. Well, one of the ways you've made art in the most recent period is in a very public way. The critic Tom Hess uh, recently described public art as images that have outgrown their frames and pushed themselves into your life, or at least try to. I think what he was in part referring to was the mural that you completed in 1977 at 7th Avenue and 42nd Street, where there were 24 heads of what appeared to be 24 different beautiful young women that stretched 240 feet around the corner and then are raised on the central tower, as I recall, about mm -hmm. 54 feet. How would you describe these epic forms? Well, that is... Uh, How did that whole thing come about? Well, it's a real... It's kind of... Uh, 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 a woman called me up on the telephone and said, would you be interested in painting something on Times Square? <laughs> and... <laughs> How could you resist? Why could I resist? <laughs> it was very hard to be cool. <laughs> and uh, so I went there and, and, and she was a little funny, but anyway, she had these two billboards. And one was a real monster, big one, but it was square. And there was this other shape that just took my imagination. Now, it wasn't as big as the other one, but it was just a sensational shape. And she told me that RKO, the people who were in that building, or that one, would donate that billboard, something about Times Square. But anyhow, she got fired, or left the job. And it had to do with the improvement of Manhattan on 42nd Street, you know. And they weren't interested in it at all, <laughs> as an improvement. <laughs> but uh, the guy had donated the billboard, and the only way I could he donated the billboard? Well, he donated the time on the billboard, the RKL. And the only way I could present anything was to do it. So I said, uh, I just went and spent three months and made the, made the, marquee, the Marquette. Uh, and so we had the Marquette, and we had the guy who donated, and then we had to get the money for the house painting, for the sign painters. And that took another year and a half before that thing, because it was done well. Uh, I know someone at Exxon, someone would know someone at Exxon Oil, you know. And You're still waiting for a reply, I trust. Something like that. Or they come down and look at it and say, yeah, this is beautiful, but it's not, <laughs> it's not our image. <laughs> or something like that. And on and on and on. And so finally, there were some patrons that came by, and they all chipped in, and we got the whole thing together. And then well, we one of the things, you gave them something in return for their, as you say, chipping in, didn't you? Yeah, well, I let them have the sketches, which... You cut up the original... Well, it had to be cut up mm -hmm. for the sign painters. See, the Marquette was like 15 feet long, and it was 15 feet to uh, three-quarters of an inch to a foot. So I chopped, it had to be chopped up. They can't handle the what whole thing. What is the scale? Three-quarters of an, an inch, inch to a foot. foot. Yeah. 
and uh, it had to be chopped up because they wanted to paint with, uh, they would photograph if I liked and go with colored photos, but I wanted them to work with the real thing. Well, I assume not only the aesthetic and ideological difficulties of permitting your work to be ex executed by another, uh, there are real aesthetic problems, for example, the colors that you used right. and, the col and how they translated those colors into that billboard. Were there any limitations that you placed on yourself oh, with sure. that in mind? Yeah, definitely. I made, a, I, I made a marquette that another painter could paint. Any painter? Any painter who was pretty, you know, had some talent. You and know. how did you control that? Well, did you eliminate or add any colors? Or? No, the colors, uh, uh, the colors, like all, all the paintings I do, they have like a light, which, is the, which sort of holds, once you get the light, the kind of light figured out, then the colors don't matter. In other words, you could put this color or that color, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, as long as you have that light idea clear. But there is nuance. What about the grays? Well, this was a very kind of uh, bright light. And I wanted it so it looked good in daylight. I wanted a real kind of clear light. And so I made steps that were, that, you know, each step in color and tone is really definite. And so it was almost like, as you were seeing it in, in a bright light. Now the background, the green, was if the f light was on the face and there was a gray wall behind, but I transposed it up into a color. And the first transposition went into kind of uh, uh, that DuPont red, you know, it's called Monastrel or something. So it's a sort of a hokey red. And that looked too much like everything else, and I just transposed it to green. That's how we got to that color. The light was actually an optical thing. It was a gray wall, and I just transposed the, the chroma on it up, right? Uh, and the color steps are all very clear, and I stayed out of pearly gray tones. I mean, it was a gray there, it's like a real blunt gray. And each tone, now the edges are what separates it from a design. I have a lot of open edges on it, but they're isolated. Like, when, if I did hair, I would try to make the hair so if I got the right color, I could use a lot of one color and just at the edge make that into soft hair rather than having to put pieces of hair all over the place, you know? Mm -hmm. So it actually... Does any color hair lend itself to that more than others? Because you have a sprinkling of different colors. Well, I did it all, 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 all for it, 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 the, the browns <laughs> and blacks worked out better that way on that. Mm -hmm. But those were the things. And the sign painter actually uh, knew my work and liked it. And he mixed those colors. He could mix any of those colors in, in you know, five and six minutes he mixed, mixed the colors. He was just a whiz at it. He went right to the problems of where the edges, and asked me about them, and I said, make them broad. And we didn't know whether it would carry, because it was kind of soft, and mostly the secondary tones on the faces. And he made them a little stronger, and uh, I was right, and we made them lighter after that. But he was, he's terrific, because there was no way of figuring it out until you, until you did it. And he was afraid to let it all go open, and we did. And it was, it was really kind of... Uh, you know, kind of the most exciting thing I'd, I'd ever had my hands on. Because of the scale, because of yeah. location? Well, also, you, you had no way of knowing whether the damn thing would work. <laughs> what was the inspiration <laughs> for this breeze? Does it have any historical antecedents? Well, uh, uh, I wanted the, uh, you know, the, uh, I saw it like a freeze, and I saw it something like the Elgin Marbles, where you had a lot of motion, you know? It just moves along like that. And, and then it goes in and out. It has, it's a lot of uh, spatial things. We step back on it. it. There are like a lot of spatial arabesques, and it was like that. It seemed to make sense on that space, you know. For how long will those women be living on Forty Second Street? Well, I think uh, two years, and then I think they'll put something else there, or maybe they'll keep it there for a little more. I don't know, but it's supposed to be for two years anyway. Do you have any plans for any other public art here or elsewhere? No. I sure like doing it, you know. Well, up until, I guess, uh, the early 60s, your work was surely of a different scale and a different color. How did pop and its orbit affect your work? Well, 
Well, I think there are different there there are there are things in the air. The, the, actually, it's the late fifties, and uh, where the whole thing of uh, the kind of seriousness of existentialism and the abstract expressionist thing was, you know, was sort of things that I, I think a, 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 a lot of younger artists, or a number of younger artists, felt just wasn't suitable for their temperament. And so there were a whole bunch of related, uh, related uh, things going on. Um, um, well, did the cartoon-like modeling and the advertising art well, and the always, color, did yeah. that all influence you? Yeah, well, I've always uh, uh, liked uh, Like I liked illustrations, like in the 50s. I have paintings, you know, called the Arrow Shirt Man. I don't know whether you remember that, you know, right? That was sort of like a late 50s painting. Uh, the the uh, blow-up. I guess is what the thing is the is the thing uh, of pop pop art and um, the way pop art the way this trend was finally defined as pop art it sort of it seemed to me kind of it seemed okay but it was arbitrary it seemed a little arbitrary because the, the the first people was sort of connected w with it, not, not not the older painters, you know. And I mean, like it was like uh, was um, the Pie Man and Jim Dine, you know. And it seemed to be going along that way, and it became over to Andy Warhol and Lichtenstein. It just moved over, and I I don't know. It, it wasn't the it wasn't somehow the painters who defined it. it was people outside of it now. I think it created an atmosphere where where there was uh, where people looked at new subject matter, you know, the pop, the uh, uh, or looked at it more seriously. Uh, I can speak for myself that uh, I uh, was looking at a lot of TV in the early um, let's see, early 60s, and I like the the way they projected images up front, an enlargement. And I was looking for a way to make a painting that I could put next to a Kleiner and de Kooning. You know? Mm -hmm. And th I don't know whether you remember those TV ads. There were some TV ads where they had hair, and they take the hair, and it'd be a 14-inch screen. It'd be right in the living room. And those were things I was thinking about when I was enlarging, you know, which was real early. Uh, the thing of where uh, where you'd say what was the idea of like uh, becoming be be involved with pop art. Uh, let's see, as in its purest sense. In other words, if I if I had, like in 1962, it would be very easy to uh, just try to compete as a pop artist. In other words. Uh, it didn't seem right. It didn't seem right for my temperament. Somehow, you'd have to give up too much. So it just uh, <laughs> bungled along, you know. By with, now. A, with uh, you know, what do you have? Uh, a lot of ideas, <laughs> you know. By now, and I'm talking about currently. It's been said almost everywhere that. Uh, when one characterizes the current art scene, that it is free from isms, no more abstract exp expressionism, no more minimalism, no more yeah, well, it's, it's, ism. It's changed How would you a lot. describe the current scene? Well, I think it's gotten very much that way, and and it seemed uh, it seemed awful to be put into position that you had to join a movement. <laughs> Because they promote art, art through movements in this country, or they have. Well, that was certainly a European than, model. Well, yeah, rather than through uh, uh, trends. I mean, there are ideas that some uh, some artists are more interesting than other artists. You know, so some artists just aren't very interesting. No one's interested in their ideas, and 
lively artists gravitate towards ideas that are lively or interesting. And there are trends in ideas, but the uh, that packaging thing that started with the abstract expressionists, where everyone jumped, well, all these weird bunch of guys jumped in the same bed, you know, the cellless thing. Uh, you know, I mean, there are a lot of terrific painters, but the idea of that seemed like a real simplification of art. And when it finally puts you in the position, if you buy that whole ticket, that you've got to say, so-and-so is a lousy painter because so-and-so supports him, or something like that. Or so-and-so is a lousy painter because he does this. And um, I don't think it's that easy. <laughs> yeah. Let me quote what Hilton Kramer said about you once. He described your art as being singularly devoid of angst or uncertainty, and that it was an art in love with surfaces, which the artist deems wholly sufficient for his purposes. Then he goes on to describe you as a second generation artist, a spiritual denizen of 10th Street, a true believer in the New York school. Yet he, he meaning you, managed without rocking any boats to come out untouched by any of the grosser unorthodoxies of the 10th Street milieu. Is that the way you see it too? Well, it's very, I think it's very nice to be seen, <laughs> seen that way. I, I think, uh, I think yeah, the thing of... And if you did do it, how did you do it? Oh, I, I, I haven't any idea, but I do think, uh, like what he says about surfaces is absolutely true. No. The surfaces and appearances to me are just really sensational. And I I in a meaning and things like that always seem to be some preconditioned idea about content that I've always been very skeptical of. What about this commitment to the New York School? Well, I think the values, uh, the, um, the biological values of the older painters seemed very exciting to me, you know, and uh, that was part of it, that kind of, the idea of, of uh, a grand scale I got looking at Rothko and Klein and Pollock and thinking about it, you know, but to have to paint, uh, it's, it's, to paint a painting like that just seemed like impossible for someone like me. Are they the painters who particularly informed your sensibility? Well, they are painters that I admired a great deal at, at different times, you know. Are they still an influence on your work, or are there others? Well, there are others, but, they, but the idea of the, uh, that ambition to do a large-scale painting certainly comes from looking at their work, you know. And to whose work do you most respond now? Well, I don't know. I, I, um, it, that's a very, uh, uh, you know, kind of funny question because you respond to different things in different ways. You know, I saw that show up in Albany and I thought that was the friend. New York, the state of art, right. you're referring to. And I thought that those small room with the Franz clients just looked absolutely ravishing, you know. You're saying that in contrast to the enormous scale of some of the other no, works. No, no, I liked the whole show, and I liked a lot of the paintings, but I hadn't thought of Klein in a long time, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I don't know. No, I think I still like those painters, painters as much. I think I've been looking uh, at uh, different things. Uh, I got interested in Watteau and things, you know, kind of all kinds of different things. It, I, don't, I, I don't know what I'm looking at. Is there the work of any younger artist that particularly engages you? Well, um, let's say, let's put it this way. Uh, it's, it's less than it used to be, but I'm a person who likes painting, and I like looking at lots of bad paintings. You know? So I see shows of younger artists, and I don't know whether they're any good or not. You just see it whether it's interesting. If it's interesting enough, you're going to see the next show of the person, but you don't think of it in terms of influencing me, or I don't think of it in terms of good and bad even. Uh, you know? That's what, but I might be getting something from it. I don't know. You know? I mean, that's the way I look at it. I don't have to say a painting's good or bad. I'm, I'm just a painter. Well, there are some people who have to, or at least feel obliged to say, whether paintings are good or bad. And I'm talking about art critics. 
What do you think of the, contem the state of contemporary art criticism? Well, I don't know. I think it's, uh, it was a lot worse. It was a lot worse 20 years ago. <laughs> worse in what way? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, well, I think the, the, uh, there's more of it now. There's a lot more criticism. And I think there are more interesting people writing now than there were, than there were 20 years ago on a regular basis and on an occasional basis. What do you think of the state of art education? Oh, I know there's been a big explosion in this country that's uh, uh, strange. I, I, I think it affects art in this way. Uh, it's, it's increased the audience for art, and, and it's made a higher standard of living for younger artists coming up, which allows a person the opportunity to spend 10 years being a, a social failure, which uh, painters generally need. They don't grow up until they're 35 or 40, usually. That's when they're young. And this art education, sort of, there's crumbs off the table that makes it easier for painters growing up. I think you have a little more, you, you know, I think it benefits, the, it benefits the painters. And I think it benefits the people who take it, because well, at worst, they can go to museums when they're stuck in London or something, you know? So I, I sort of approve of it. I spoke to the president of a major art educational institution today, and she said that she felt the state of art, art education was deplorable. She felt it was lacking, I think, in both rigor and vigor. How do you respond to that? Well, I don't know. You have more and more people who are taking art courses, so it really can't be that boring. You know, people are interested in it. There are some critics who see a folk art look in your work. Sometimes I've heard it described as a cross between Giotto and Crazy Cat's cartoons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Another critic, Robert Rosenblum, says that the way you employ structural boldness puts you, I guess, in a class by yourself. You make us see the poetry of the ordinary. Which is closer to how you see your work? <laughs> well, I know the stuff looks primitive, but that isn't, that's like a byproduct. It certainly isn't an intention, you know, to, uh, to make it look like a... And I don't really like... Uh, uh, I like uh, signs sometimes, because they're really big, uh, but I don't like cartoons. Too small. Well, it's, they're also... Um, the, uh, the cartoon is, is uh, a symbol, as a sign, rather. A let, me, let me put it this way. The, the difference between a sign and a symbol? Okay. Uh, a sign is sort of like an orange sun. A symbol would be some guy keeps painting the sun until he, till he makes something that works, that works on different levels. Anyhow. I'm involved in making symbols, not signs, and cartoons. So I, I think it might look like a cartoon, but it isn't the intention. You know, it's completely the opposite. Can you imagine doing something that is drastically different from that which you do now? Well, I couldn't imagine I'd ever be doing the stuff I'm doing now 15, 20 years ago. It just seems totally weird. You know, if I had a thing like, you're going to be doing this, I would have said, you're crazy, because I just wanted to make nice little paintings that were personal. And I ended up, uh, you know, thumping my chest like, a, you know, like, a, like, a, like, a, like an opera singer or something. <laughs> Actually, your sense of drama, I assume, comes to you quite naturally. As the son of a, an actress on the Yiddish stage, a Stanislavski student herself, I assume you've long since you know, had a sense of theater. In the most recent period, and that is uh, with the NEA involving an increasing number of painters and sculptors in designs for the performing arts, you too have manifested an interest in theater and dance. How and when and why did you first become involved in these various theatrical and I dance think. collaborative efforts? Well, it was the, um, I think the first one I did was 59 or something like that and I'd seen uh, Paul Taylor and I just thought it was just fantastic 
and um, Rauschenberg was doing a set for Paul, and Paul was going to Spoleto, and the set was that there's a still life on the, t on the stage, and all of a sudden it gets up and it's Paul Taylor, the still life is on his back. You know, that's a pretty terrific uh, theatrical thing, and Paul says, I'm not dancing with your still life on my back. Change it. And Bob, you know, like a real true artist, said, forget it, you, you dance with that. <laughs> it's a great idea. And they parted company, and they needed someone to do a set real quick. And Edwin Denby said, uh, told uh, Paul to look at my work or something. And Paul, I guess, I guess I had a show or something. I don't know what happened. But anyhow, he asked me to do it. And so I came over and did one. And it was, I just saw it, and I knew, knew exactly, I didn't know what, uh, I know what Bob's idea was, but I just saw it as a collage, a little collage. The minute I saw it, and um, uh, it was to be in Italy in Spoleto, and they had a canted stage, so I made the, the floor uh, bright green, and the, and the back dropped blue, and it had pastel colors on the dancers. And it's, I never saw it, but it's supposed to work out pretty good. And Paul asked me to come back and do another one, and that you know, and that one was a Bach thing. That Paul was doing. And I just saw a little bit of it, and I thought it was able. It's like one of those things that um, you didn't know you had talent, and it was like a real blast. It was, I you know I I was, I didn't think I had any talent in doing anything outside of painting. I was wobbly about that, but I saw that and I could get it right away. It was real simple. And I went home and I made the set in about 15 minutes. You know, because I had the ideas all clear and just all came together. And what it was, it was Paul was playing this Bach piece. Um, he still might do it sometimes. And, and the people turn around a lot. And they're great lines. And it's like it had a, a, an inner energy that was exploding. It was very Baroque. And I'd always thought of Bach as being something cool and in planes. And it was like Paul had another idea about Bach, and, you know? Mm -hmm. And I saw it, you know, like it saw it, I sort of got it in about a second and a half, it seemed. It just seemed sensational. And I went home and uh, made these leotards and had different colors on the front and different colors on the back. And we had uh, ribbons that were about this wide and they were about this far apart. And when the people revolved, it just spread the line all over the place. And I wanted it all lit flat. And no one had done any flat lighting. They always lit in puddles, like Martha Graham. And the, I broke the, 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 the girls' uh, leotards here. And I had a patch of green in here. And the girls, uh, the girl dancers just all screamed. They said, you don't like women, do you? <laughs> <laughs> and things like that. And uh, uh, and, uh, the set I presented to Paul was a strange set. And Paul, you know, was really like uh, aces. He, he always said, well, let's see what it looks like on the stage. You know? And we're on the stage, and it was a big hit, and then everyone saw the, the, the girls' side, the, the costumes were very sexy. <laughs> and uh, they still use it occasionally. But that's the way that started. And the thing with Kenneth Koch started, I had a cutout thing, show. And they came in and said, let's make a play. You know? And it was real simple. We just... That was a more rational uh, thing with, with, a, with a dance thing. What was the play that you did, the collaboration with Kenneth Koch? It was Koch. George Washington crossing the Delaware. And that was, half the people were cutouts, the other half were flats. It was just a real, uh, you know, when you have a whole bunch of people jammed together with different ideas, fighting all the time. It was like Something that. Something good is bound to happen. Well, it did in that case, I guess. <laughs> did you see it? No, I'm afraid I oh. haven't. It was in 1961 or two. I guess what it was, uh, I never worked with a director. I'd always worked with Paul. And with Paul, I could do anything I wanted. And if it didn't work, I'd just throw it away. And with the director, I found out there's a, you know, the director just controls everything. You know, and he said, I think we ought to have uh, a big circular stairs on the middle of the stage for, for, for George Washington to come down. And I said, that's about the stupidest thing I ever heard of. <laughs> because you're stuck with a big turkey in the middle of the stage. <laughs> and uh, I found out that he had more power than I did. Uh, the, the, the writer, Kenneth Koch, just sold me down the river to this guy, because they, 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 they both came over and said, 
What do you think of the play? I, said, I think it's swell. I think we'll do it this way, this way, this way. I said, great idea, Alex. <laughs> and when I start making the stuff, they just threw out all my ideas and start working with theirs. And then we start fighting. And the way I got around the staircase, I just, I just said to the producer, I said, I think his idea of that staircase is, is okay. In fact, I think it's pretty good. And I can make it to you for 500 bucks. And the producer went to the director and says, I think Mr. Katz's aesthetics <laughs> are superior to yours in this case. <laughs> that was the end of the staircase. And it was sort of that kind of... <laughs> it went along like that. Was the theater a very strong influence on your early life? No. No, it just... I'd gone to uh, theater a bit. It was just one of those things out of the blue that uh, just seemed to make sense. How did you ever become an artist? I don't know. I always liked uh, fooling around with it. Um, but by the time I was in high school, I decided I wanted to be a commercial artist. I didn't know anything. We had like fine art paintings in the house, but there was no contact with anything like that. It was sort of something very exotic. And uh, and I heard the, the stories I heard about pain. This was like what you heard. They all starve. You know, if you hold the, you know, now you hear stories about painters that get uh, masters and teach in, in universities. But when I was growing up, you heard stories of painters starving. And and we can tell you some contemporary ones too. You yeah. have a city that has thirty thousand art makers, and when in the end, we only know of a handful of artists. There are obviously a lot of people out there that are really struggling. Oh, they're struggling, but I meant starving. I didn't mean struggling, you know? It was, uh, it's struggling when it's someone else. No, I think, I think uh, the great thing in this country is that it has such a high standard of living that you can uh, exist on a part-time job and do whatever you feel like. I think that's sensational. I didn't think of that. I thought it was much more severe. I thought of it as like uh, really not having food. And that, I figured, and then I figured I, I wasn't, uh, I really didn't have the talent anyway. There wasn't any, that much showing, but I liked doing it. And I just kept, basically it had to do with self-indulgence. As contrasted, and you make, I think, an interesting point, as contrasted to the 70s, and I assume the foreseeable future, when it is not only a credible, but ultimately a potentially lucrative way to make a life, to be an art maker. Obviously, that was not the case when no, you were growing up. No. Oh, absolutely not. It just seemed when I first... Uh, no, because it was, it was a, a socially fugitive occupation. When you finally sort of said... When I finally, after I was out of art school, I said, I'm going to be a fine artist. You know? That was it. And you went into a fugitive world. It's not, nothing like what it is today. Today, it's really respectable. Uh, it was really socially fugitive. Uh, How did you make your way while you were trying to assert yourself as a painter? Well, uh, generally what I did was uh, most of the, 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 the most stable thing I did was work in a frame shop three days a week, carving frames. And that was kind of uh, interesting because we were the... Uh, it was a very good shop, and we did a lot of the stuff's in the National Gallery, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and um, the guy came in with drawings and stuff like that. The man's name was Feist. He had a place up on Madison Avenue. And it was an interesting job, and um, I got quite skilled at it. And no one talked to me much, and it was quite, quite pleasant. I mean, I really liked it. <laughs> and it went on. But, it, you know, you're sort of like very marginal economically. And you're really like a creep to, to, the, to the rest of the world. And it's all changed now. It isn't that way anymore. And I think it's, be, it's better for the people involved. If you, if, if you live uh, fugitively too long, it really has a bad effect uh, on your social behavior. That's my opinion, anyway. <laughs> I think there's some evidence to support that. Yeah, you have yeah, people, who, yeah, 20 years of that, and you have a pretty weird person on your hands. <laughs> How did you become a, tense, a part of the 10th Street group? Well, when I got out of art school, I moved into around 6th Street, and then I had got a scholarship to Scott, Scott Hegan, and it was Bill, Bill King from Cooper. He was there a year before. He, and Lois... It met Kajori and Ippolito, and they decided to form a, a little gallery on 4th Street. 
And, uh, well, I knew half the people in it, in the cooperative. I thought it was a stupid idea, actually. And uh, it just went boom. It had a lot of energy. And then they opened it up on 10th Street. And it just was, it just was explosive. And then all the other galleries came on 10th Street. And so that I was sort of there where I was living on 6th Street, you know. And there was this scene starting right around, right around you. A whole bunch of people are, were in New York, and um, there was they couldn't be accepted in the gallery system, in the existing structure. So they decided to make these other structures, and that's how it started. How important is it for an artist to be a part of the art establishment? I don't know, things have changed quite a bit. Uh, I, I think I was very fortunate in getting this kind of terrific apprenticeship for 10 years of hanging around, where I had access to uh, all this kind of very developed dialectics, very bright people. You know, the dialectics were very bright. And I sat around and listened a lot, and I learned an awful lot. And so I thought it was pretty I was pretty lucky. Uh, a lot of people now with the uh, magazines and with uh, traveling artists, you know, in university and stuff, are able to get at things uh, in, in other places, you know? You mentioned your studying at Skowhegan. I guess it's more than 20 years now that you have had a spent your summers in, is it Lincolnville, Maine? Yeah. Is that a summer place where the talk is apt to be more about work or play? Oh, no, it's, it's, I don't think there's much talk. <laughs> <laughs> it's just really nowhere. You know, there were, I don't know, Rudy Burkhardt lives about 15 miles away, and you might see him once in a while. It's really quiet. And uh, I don't know, I want to tell you, read books and paint. Just, you know, really uh, have very quiet summers. Do you work like during the summers, too? Yeah, I work very hard in the summer. Do you paint every day? Well, I go into the studio every day, sometime, yeah. <laughs> what are you working on now? Um, I'm working on, uh, let's see, I have a whole bunch of things I'm working on. I'm working on uh, some women in hats. They're separate paintings, and they're three feet high, and I've done four of them. Did uh, you say hats? Hats. Without people? No, women in hats. Oh, together. Women with hats, yeah. It seemed I bumped in, you know, it was just like, had nothing to do, and I decided, well, I said, well, oh, uh, what it was, Ada bought, my wife bought a hat for my kid, and he didn't like the hat, or it was the wrong size, so she put it on her head, and I said, hey, wait a minute, let me try that. You know, I'd like to do something with hats, fashionable, fashionable, fashionable ladies in hats. So I did one, and it looked pretty good. The campaign came out terrific. So I said, well, maybe I'll try, try a series of them. Because I, I hadn't painted this high on anything in a long time. I might do one or two paintings that, that size uh, a year. So I'm working on those. Then I had an idea. I've been painting people in their environment. You now you call somebody up and bring over your paint and paint them. It's usually been two people. And I... I called Larry Rivers up. I realized I never painted him. I thought I'd like to paint an artist. And he said, you want to paint me working? I said, well, no, I said, you know, I said, well I'll, wait a minute, I'll think about it. I said, I never painted anyone working. It's a wild idea. And the idea of the artist that the brush is like that, you know, looking at the audience, it seemed like the old... This kind of idea. Right? Uh -huh. And I said, it's terrific. And very often, other people's ideas are better than mine with regard to what I, what I do. And so I went over there, and he had his kind of, he had an airbrush, and <laughs> <laughs> so I started on it. And I don't know where the where the thing is going. It's just going like this, and you know, it doesn't make any sense. And maybe I'll get a painting out of it. Maybe I won't. Do you leave your materials in his studio while you're working? Yeah, well, I did for to make the sketches. When I start working on the actual paintings, I work them in my studio. Is there a great deal of pre preparation for the kinds of yeah, paintings? Yeah, it's a lot of preparation. Yeah. Anyhow, did a study of your dog as well. It's actually quite well known. It's probably one of the better known Sky Terriers around. I'm thinking of Sonny. Right. And here is this enormous painting of a dog's head. Is that really a 
parody of human portraiture? No, the first dog I did was Sonny, and I wanted to do uh, two heads on one canvas over, overlapping each other. It was like volumes, two, two overlapping volumes. And I went through every variation I could think of. You know, I did the, uh, the boy and the girl. I did two boys. I did two, two men, I mean. Two men, two women. Uh, I did the, the, the mother and child. I kept changing the compositions. And at the end of the summer, I said, I'm going to do a boy and a dog. You know? So I put the dog in the bottom, and they overlapped the boy, and it was kind of fun. And it was kind of a nice, goofy painting. Uh, and uh, the next summer, I made a sketch of the dog in the grass. I just saw it. It was one of those things, we were at the beach, and I looked up and saw the dog in the grass, and it was just fantastic looking. I said, I've got to paint it. Then, you know, the mechanical thing, how do you paint a dog in the grass? That was the real problem. The next problem was, uh, well, it's e it was easy this big. It was hard to get it up to this size. But when I got it that size, I said, well, gee whiz, let's go all the way with it. You know, so I went right up to eight feet high. And it was a matter of a technical problem. Could you make that paint move that size? I wasn't thinking of the subject matter as a little grotesque, I guess. You know? <laughs> but I, I had no idea, you know, that... Uh, it seemed like there were going to be four paintings I was going to have in my permanent collection. Uh -huh. <laughs> What's your greatest pleasure in being an artist? Gee, I don't know. I think it's waking up in the morning and reading the paper and knowing I can do whatever I want to do today. I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> thank you, Alex Katz, mm -hmm. for being with us. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and thank you for being with us, too. And what our procedure is now is to invite the class to participate in this conversation. If you will raise your hand or a paper or something, I will call on you. But please speak in as loud a voice as possible. If the rest of you can't hear the question, you raise your hand so that we will repeat it. Because all of the proceedings are taped and we'd like to hear what you have to say as well. But before I forget, I notice that there are people that are still holding cards. And if you will pass them to the aisle, to the, uh, what side is this? The, uh, your right. Um, someone will pick them up, please. And if you don't have a card, please indicate that too, so we'll give you a card to fill out. There are some people, Barry, please, there are some people who came a little later in the back. What we're asking every, each person to do is indicate name, address, telephone number in the event of emergency, and after this week's uh, snow, that should, I guess, convince us all. Uh, what you do if you choose to tell us as a way of life, why you've come here, and what you'd like the particular emphasis or focus to be. Also, if you do not have a schedule, uh, please raise your hand also. I think he has them as well. And while those are being collected, there are some here, if you have either one at the end of the hour and you don't have one, there are some up front. Why don't we spend our remaining minutes now by asking you to participate in the conversation. If you have a question, please raise your hand so that you can be called upon. Yes, and you indicated before you were an artist yourself. How do you define realism? I don't know, just, uh, I just